We are finishing up our, our series, Winning at Home. Today is the last Sunday in our series, Winning at Home. We'll be doing a couple different things the next couple weeks I'll be preaching, and then in the month of July, we're going to go into just a new sermon series, walking through some parables, but uh, I've so enjoyed this idea and concept of winning at home. We started off, you remember, a number of weeks ago asking this question, who likes to win? Who likes to win? And I remember specifically that almost everybody raised their hand. I don't remember anybody raising their hand when I said who likes to lose. I think everyone was like, bro, I'm in. Like, I want to win. And so what we did specifically at the beginning is we were focusing specifically on Matthews 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, where Jesus said, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And the word Beatitude actually means supreme blessedness, supreme blessedness. So Jesus says, if you want to be supremely blessed, you're going to do the things that I instruct. And remember, he says at the end of chapter 7, we actually looked at a passage of scripture where Jesus says that we are going to be blessed and our house is going to be found on the rock if we do the things that he tells us to do. If we follow what his word says. And again, in my life, I'm like, dude, I want to be blessed, not just blessed. I want to be supremely blessed. I want to win. And I want to make sure in my life, and I want to make sure in your life, that we are winning in the areas that matter most. Because a lot of times we can win in areas that ultimately aren't going to matter. And we want to make sure that we are winning in the areas that matter most. And so I love that as we are here today and we celebrate Father's Day and we talk about fathers, I think it's so important because I believe it starts in the home specifically with fathers. So I'm going to ask the question I asked at the beginning, and I'll ask it for fathers today. If you are a dad in the room today... How many dads in the room want to be blessed? Anybody want to be blessed? Raise your hand. Yes. Is there any dads that don't want to be blessed? Any dads that you're like, no, thank you? And I'm not talking about the donuts either. You know what I'm saying? You're like, man, I got to pass on the donuts. But uh, no, I think we all want to be blessed. And we all want our children to be blessed. And so when Jesus sits down at the Sermon on the Mount and, and sets everyone down in the field, he begins to teach and and he walks through eight statements, and we've looked at the majority of them. Remember, again, quick recap, because we're finishing up. He says that those that hunger after righteousness, he said, they're going to be filled. And Jesus calls us, if you remember, to, to be peacemakers, not just keepers, but peacemakers, that, that in order to have peace in our homes, to win at home, we have to step in. It's going to take effort, energy, prayer, faith, dependence on the Lord. He said that if we're persecuted for, for doing right, we're actually blessed. We're blessed if we're, if we're persecuted. He says those that give mercy shall receive mercy. We started early on talking about those that are poor in spirit, humble, that it's with humility. We say, God, we need your help. Here's the thing I want you to know today. Maybe you're a guest today. We're thankful you're here. Church family, we should all know this by now, but none of us in this room have it figured out. No, nobody in here is the finished product. And being in ministry for, for uh, over 25 years, the, the people that make me the most nervous in my life are the ones who act like they have it all figured out. Like, give me someone that's struggling, but knows it and knows the source is the Lord, and bro, we can, we can make something happen by God's grace. Amen. You give me someone that comes in and like, I got it, bro, great, you're, you're lucky to have me today. My Sunday school class is lucky that I'm the teacher. I'm a deacon, and man, you're lucky that I'm serving, bro. I'm like, good luck with all that, right? Because, man, no, we all got things we can work on. And, and Jesus, in his kindness and his goodness, the Lord, our Heavenly Father, in his kindness and his goodness says, man, I'm going to tell you some things to help you. That There's a deep blessing that, that can sustain. We're not talking about superficial happiness. The, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, there, there's a better way. There's a better way. And so we spent time looking at winning at home. We spent time last week looking at singleness. And I was so thankful for Jordan's challenge last week on singleness. And Craig spent time talking about technology and how to navigate technology in just a crazy world. And again, we don't have it figured out, but we're looking into his word. And so today we're going to talk about dads. And I love that we're finishing with dads. Men are the head of the home according to scriptures. And God looks to us fathers in this room to give leadership. And I believe we're going to be held accountable. So it's a responsibility we have to take very, very serious. If you're single today in this room, maybe you're a single mom in the room or, 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 or um, whatever you find yourself today, I believe there's some principles that can be very, very beneficial for you today. 
Single mom specifically today, I just want to give you a shout out. Uh, as a product of a single mom, never meeting my dad, I'm so thankful for the single moms in the room that are pulling double duty, that are playing some daddy duty and some mama duty and are working and trying to make it happen. And so I pray you're encouraged by this challenge today, even for you and for your own life, because I'm so thankful for what you are doing, single fathers as well. I want us to start off with prayer, and I haven't preached in two weeks, so I have two weeks worth of notes today. So uh, let's listen quick, because I'm going to go quick. But uh, let's go to Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads this morning, all on campus, online as well, every head bowed, every eye closed. And I just want you to pray in your seat this morning, two quick things, and then I'm going to pray over you. The first thing I'd, I'd like for you to pray is very simple, Lord, speak to me. We say it every week. But, but would you just in humility, everyone in the room, first time you're here, maybe you've not been here before, maybe you're just here to be with the dad this morning, but would you just pray in your own heart quietly, Lord, speak to me. And then secondly, I'd like for you to pray this this morning in your seat. Would you pray, Lord, speak through Grant. Lord, speak through Grant this morning. Because ultimately, in my own strength and abilities, church family, I don't have much to offer today unless the power of the Holy Spirit does a work. And so that's what I'm asking it's for the Lord to move. So Father, we do come, for you, come with you, excuse me, this morning to you with this posture of humility, asking for you to move today asking for you to do a work in this place. Lord, I, I don't know every situation and circumstance that's in this room. I, I don't know every dad that is killing it and just doing amazing and every dad that is just discouraged and beaten up walking in this room today, but you know every heart, every situation. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work today. Pray for those who aren't dads today, that, that you would even use this message to encourage them in their life today. And so for that to happen, Father, I pray that you would use me this morning just as an instrument and a mouthpiece today. We surrender the service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter five is where we're going to be in a minute. James Dobson says this, if homes are going to survive, it will be because husbands and fathers, again, place their families at the highest level on their systems of priorities. If homes are going to survive, it will be because husbands and fathers, again, place their families at the highest level on their system of priorities. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 is going to be a springboard to, we're actually going to look at a number of texts today. We're not going to be in one specific text. We're going to look at a number of texts today. Excited about being in the parables in a few weeks, and we'll just focus in on some specific texts. But Matthew 5, 5 says this, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is defined as humble, patient, gentle, self-controlled. Humble, patient, gentle, self-controlled. So when Jesus is teaching on the Sermon of the Mount, he has everybody seated and he begins to teach. What Jesus says in this moment is he says, blessed are those that are meek. He says, because you're going to inherit the earth. Again, he's talking about like the, those that don't self-promote, that aren't patting themselves on the back, but humble, gentle, self-controlled. Inherit the earth there means always satisfied. So it's not like the meek are going to like literally like inherit the earth in the sense of they get everything, but it's like the meek are satisfied with what they have. You ever met someone that you think doesn't have much, but they're just satisfied? This is that idea. Blessed are the meek, the humble, the teachable, the self-controlled, because they're going to maybe in certain times of life seem like they don't have anything, but they got everything. You know what I'm talking about? Have you met someone that seems like they have everything, and then when you get to be around them a lot, you're discouraged because you realize they really don't have anything? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like what Jesus is teaching here is really countercultural, because a lot of times it's in this time, and it's the same in our time, we think that strong, powerful are successful and, and rule the world. But so many times we see strong, powerful, arrogant leaders seeking world domination, and what we find is emptiness, brokenness. And they are trying to offset this deep brokenness inside of them with this facade that everything is great and I'm winning, 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 when in the area of life that matters the most, they're not. Are y'all tracking with me? And what I want to make sure for us as fathers in this room is that we are winning in the area God desires for us to win in. We are winning in areas of eternal things, not temporal things. There's a lot of people that will take their last breath victorious because of the great accomplishments on an earth that's going to go away. And we need to make sure we're trying to win the right areas of our life. So Jesus says, the meek, they shall inherit the earth. They're going to be satisfied with a humble, teachable spirit seeking the Lord. You can look through examples in the scripture. You can think, if you can go back to Genesis, you can look at Abraham and, and Lot back in Genesis. Uh, 
The scripture says that Abraham was, was meek. And, and if you remember, the, 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 you can go back and, and read it in Genesis chapter 13. But Abraham and Lot, if you remember, Abraham, even in his, in his meekness and humility, tells Lot, Lot, you can choose what land that you want. And from the world's perspective, Lot made the right choice. He chose Sodom and Gomorrah, and he heads down to this city, and Abraham and his family go to this valley. So it would have seemed like from the outside, Abraham, you lost, bro. Like, this guy got everything, and you got nothing. And then here we are thousands of years later talking about Abraham and his faithfulness and how he obeyed God and God's blessings on his life. Because you can't always tell who's winning from the outside. And again, it's so important that we, we realize this in our life. And this is the phrase that we have been using this entire series. We are not just a Christian family. We are Christ-centered home. Now, I'm not talking about, again, families that all around us that claim to be Christians and do not exhibit Christ's likeness in their life. When I'm not talking about just saying, coming to church 2.4 times a month or whatever it is, the average is less than that right now, but uh, coming to church and saying a few things and knowing a couple of this and doing these things, I'm talking about our lives being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and being surrendered to God daily in our lives. This is what we're talking about when we're saying that we're not just a Christian family. We are a Christ-centered home. When we're Christ-centered, the lenses that we see the world through are different. And this is the things that we're talking about today. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, he, he's not referring to weakness. We, we think meekness is, is weakness, but that's not true in, in God's economy. Two examples, just real quick. My message today is like a shotgun today. There's no rhyme or reason to it. So just follow with me today. Here we go. Number one, two meek leader. There's no poems. There's no acronyms. It's just going to be, here's a bunch of stuff because your boy didn't preach for two weeks. Here we go. Number one, write this down. Two meek leaders in the Bible. Two meek leaders in the Bible. Very quickly, Moses was a meek leader in the Bible. Moses was a meek leader. Numbers chapter 12 says, now the man Moses was very humble. That word humble right there translates in some versions of the Bible as meek, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. So at one time, Moses was the meekest man and humblest on earth, which is a difficult thing to claim. You know what I mean? It's really hard to say, I want you all to know, I'm the humblest pastor, you know. Like that really, usually, that doesn't really set up right, right? But by the power of the Holy Spirit, the words were written. He was the humblest man. And what does this humble, meek man do? He leads two million people out of Egypt. Proclaimed to be one of the greatest, the greatest ruler of his generation that God used who coined the phrase, let my people go. Again, here we are thousands of years later talking about Moses and his leadership and how God used him. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness isn't weakness. It's a trust in the Lord. What about this one? Be Jesus. Meek, meek leaders in scripture. Jesus refers to himself as meek. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus says, for I am gentle and lowly, translates meek in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus refers to himself in that passage of scripture. That word lowly there again translates Greek. The, in the Greek, the meekness there is a, so, such a difficult word to translate in the English. We may or may not talk about that more here just in a couple moments. But the Savior who, who came in and flipped over the, the tables when the, when the money changers were selling goods in his house, who called out the religious leaders, who, who took on the sins of all mankind and, and laid down his life on the cross of Calvary was referred to as lowly, meek. Meekness is not weakness. And men in this room, we want to make sure that we're striving for the right things in our life. I know as men in this room, we all have this bend or this pull, and it's a good thing, I think, in a lot of different ways of dependence, of we're going to work hard, if I'm going to make it, if I got to get up early, if I got to stay late, if I'm going to do it, it's going to this, it's going to that, and all those are really great things. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't be working hard and getting up early and staying late, and preacher would say, if it's going to be, it's up to me. We're going to do all these things, but ultimately, first and foremost, it has to be a dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to, if, I, if I begin to get independent on my own without a full dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm in trouble. And so some of us see that as weakness. You know, I got to make it happen. I can't get help. I can't talk to someone. I can't do this thing because I'm a man and I'm supposed to figure this thing out. And I'm just telling you, there's a lot of men that have fallen because they thought they were islands doing it on their own. That's not what God's called you to. Meekness is it, isn't weakness. It's humility. It's self-control. It's, it's an understanding that you're not God. Dad in the room, you're not God. And you're also not the savior of the world. There was one savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he laid down his life that we might have life. And he wants us to come to him. Jesus is teaching these things, and these are counter-cultural to the people sitting in this field, listening to what he is teaching right here. 
The meek are those who quietly submit themselves to God, learn in humility, and trust in his ways. So as we lead our families, let, it, let us go to the Lord with, with meekness and in humility. N- number two, again, all over the place today, the Lord must build the house. I, I want to just give you some stuff today, men, and, and maybe one of these things will set on you and with you today. This is so important as well. The Lord must build the house. Turn over to Psalm 127 this morning. Psalm 127. I feel like I've been in this book a lot lately, Psalm 127, because I read these passages of scriptures when we're baby dedication, and there's been just a couple different instances where we've, where we've looked specifically at this passage of scripture. And if I remember correctly, I believe the first week we actually even looked at this passage of scripture because I was showing you the picture of the house in Gilcrest, Texas. You remember that house that I showed you every single week for like six straight weeks? You know, I figured I was going to show it today, but I thought you've seen the house enough. So um, Psalm 127 says this. Unless, look at the person beside you and say, unless, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city. The psalmist says, the Lord has got to build the house. He says, it's vain for you. I just said it. To rise up early and to set up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. We can work, work, work and get up early and get stay late and do all these things, but ultimately the Lord has to do a work. The Lord has to do a work. Verse three says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but speak with their enemies at the gate. And you read a passage of scripture like that, and you'll think to yourself, well, great, well, okay, wait a second. You, you, you said, it's the Lord, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. Do I have a role? We do have a role. We have a role to submit and obey and do what God has called us to do. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But okay, great, if I do that, then, then why is it? Maybe you're older in here. Maybe your kids are older in this room, and my kids are struggling, or, or these things are happening. It's because ultimately, your kids, as they get older, as your kids grow up out of the house, they have a free will to choose the choices that they make. And I've seen it in my life. Have you not seen it? A family has three kids or four kids or however many. It's the same family, the same prayers, the same rules, the same love, the same stuff. And three kids do this and one kid goes this way, right? We've all seen it. And that ultimately should cause us to have even a more dependence on the Lord because we can only do so much as parents. We want to control and navigate and do all these things, but ultimately they're walking out of the house and they're going to have to make choices. And we want to pray that they choose to serve God and love him and his word. And so we got to go to him. And so many times we have to remind ourselves that ultimately we are just stewards of the children that God has given us, dads, for the short time they're in our home. And we have to give them back to the Lord. But I also think sometimes, dad, it's, we're not using all the resources at our disposal that we have. I think that God has blessed us with a number of things, dad. And so it's not, it's this both and, right? It's not this, okay, Grant, well, God's going to have to do it, so I ain't going to do nothing. No, no. It's God's going to have to do it. And so, God, I'm asking for you to wisdom, for wisdom to do the things that you've called me to do to lead my family. Does that make sense? Because I think what happens is many times there's a pendulum that swings. You've got people over here that are just real spiritual, and they're praying and praise God, and they're doing this, but, but they're not putting in any effort or work or energy in loving and serving their kids the way God has called them to leading them. And then you have people over here that are like, I got to figure it out on my own. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to say right here, you need God and his leadings and his wisdom to do the things that he's called you to do. Are you tracking with me? This is the thing I think we see in scripture in many, many different ways. And so what I want to look at here, just for a couple moments right here, I'll ask it this way. How many of you men in here like tools? Anybody like tools in here? Any men like tools? Any men in the room? Does any men not like tools in here? You're like, I'm allergic to tools right here. Brandon, thank you very much. All right, most of the rest of us, okay. So I appreciate your honesty, Brandon. Thank you so much this morning. I read, read a quote this week. It said that, that uh, being a great father is like shaving. No matter how good you shave today, you got to get up and shave again tomorrow. <laughs> we're, ne- we're never done. Now, I, I love tools. Um, I, I just don't have a lot of tools. Uh, I have more tools now. This is not like a plea for you to give me your old tools, all right? I have more tools now, but, uh, but I, I, I love tools. Um, I, I'm just not, no, no one has ever confused old Pastor Grant um, as a master craftsman, all right? There's no, that's never been, a, no, no one's building decks calling old Pastor Grant up, all right? I just want you to know that. And, uh, but, but it's not because, I don't, because I, don't, I don't love tools. Again, I didn't, I didn't grow up with a dad. It's not a sob story, but uh, so I didn't grow up building, you know, things. I didn't, I didn't grow up hunting, doing a lot of those things. Again, don't feel bad for me. I'm not a weenie. All right, but I, I probably shouldn't have said weenie. All right, I apologize. 
Now I've said it twice, all right? So, uh, I mean, I know how to use a drill, all right? Anyway, all right, here we go. So look, so what am I talking about? Tools, back to my notes, here we go, okay. Now, I don't know how it plays out in your house, right? But in my house, here's how something plays out. Something will break in my house, and then a, a, a dialogue will go on between me and my wife. The dialogue usually goes like this. I say, I think I can fix this. <laughs> Michelle will say, no, you can't, all right? <laughs> Please call somebody. And again, I, Lord's still working on me. I've got a little bit of pride, all right? You know what I'm saying? And so I will say, oh, I can fix it. She will say, no, you cannot fix it. Now, I've hung out with Orville long enough, so I know a couple of things of what I'm doing, Orville, just a couple, all right? So one day, this has, been a, this has been a few years ago now, I remember one time the faucet outside of our house broke, and uh, it, was, it was right at the house uh, where the faucet comes outside, and it had broken, and, and it was leaking, like water was like shooting out, and Michelle's like, you need to call a plumber, and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to call a plumber. She's like, no, I'm serious. This is good. You've tried things in the past. She's like, I'm not trying to be ugly, Grant. My wife's very, very encouraging 99% of the time, but she's like... You're just gonna cost more money if you try to fix this thing on your own. And I'm like, dude, I got this. So I go outside, I'm like, sure, no problem, no problem, but I can fix it. So I walk outside, get away from the house, I turn right, and then I call Tommy McGee. And I'm like, Tommy, hey, check this out. Like, I got a faucet issue out here, and it's leaking. And he's like, well, I'll come right now. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm trying to prove something here. So you can't, I want your help, but you can't come over. So, so I start taking pictures. And I'm taking pictures, and I'm this, and Tommy's like, oh, yeah, that's no problem, man. You got this, Grant. He's trying to encourage me. And I'm like, yeah, thanks, Tommy, my guy, you know. And so, so he sends me to Lowe's. And so I'm on the phone. I'm at Lowe's. And I start buying these things at Lowe's that Tommy has told me to buy. And I come back. Well, when I get back, I, I'm looking at how much money I have spent on tools that I'll never use again. And I realize, first, I should have just called somebody and saved this money, Right? But I'm underneath my house and I'm digging around and I gotta be honest, I felt like a man, you know what I mean? I was like, I was feeling pretty tough that day and, and uh, I end up working and, and, and I do all of these things. I end, up, I end up fixing this thing and I was very, very, very excited. But I learned a very valuable lesson right then that I probably should have learned early in, in my life. But having the right tools matters. Like you try to fix something with the wrong tool, like that's just really frustrating. And so I didn't realize that there was tools specifically for what I was trying to do that made the job a lot easier. And I never would have been able to do it had I not used the tools. But not only that, and I learned another valuable lesson, that knowing how to use the tools that you have also matters, right? <laughs> like knowing how to, like you can hand me this guy right here and I could be playing with this guy for like, like the next two days and I'm gonna probably kill myself. I, have, I really don't know what, I think you shove it in something, maybe, I don't, I don't really know what that thing is at all. Now I know how to work duct tape though, you know what I'm saying? Like every guy... Every guy knows how to work duct tape, you know what I mean? You can build a roof with this stuff, all right? I mean, you can do a lot of things. But, but when you understand tools, when you understand tools, when you, when you know how to use tools to, to, to your advantage, but, but without the right tools, certain jobs would be very hard, right? Have you ever been in a situation, I'm going to get to the points in a minute, but I'm trying to build this because I want you to understand what I'm trying to say. Have you ever been in a situation where you needed a hammer and then you didn't have a hammer? And then you're trying to use something else as a hammer. And you realize how, I was in my office, it's been months ago, and I needed a hammer, and so I had my stapler out. You ever try to hammer something with a stapler? And people were coming down, what are you doing up here? And I'm like, I've almost, chink, 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 I almost have it. Like, because when you've got the right tools, it makes a big difference, but you gotta know how to use the right tools. You gotta know how to use the right tools. And here's what I wanna tell you dads in this room. You have everything that you need to parent the kids that God has given you. You have everything that you need. God has specifically ordained the children that you have in the home that they are in for you to be those children's father. God has placed you there. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a heritage of the Lord. The word heritage there means portion or inheritance. It means God has given you the children that he wanted you to have. He didn't make a mistake. God knows the children that you were supposed to have. And he placed you there for a purpose. You can be successful with them, but you have to use the tools at your disposal. And, and you know, it is tough. Being a dad is tough. I really believe being a father is difficult. You know, Mother's Day, I feel like everyone celebrates moms on Mother's Day. It's always a celebration of moms and mothers, even the commercials, right? It's like for the mother that's done everything for you, Diamonds Direct, $2,000. <laughs> Get your mom a ring to the mom that brought you into the world, you know? 
And then Father's Day, it's like cargo shorts, 12 bucks at Walmart. Like, <laughs> come now, you know? Like, I don't know, why is that? I don't know. Everyone's like, well, without moms, we wouldn't be here. Well, without that, I don't know how, you know how it works, all right? I'm just saying, sorry. <laughs> Ask your dad on the way home how it works if you're interested. But, like, listen, what am I talking about? Like, here, here's the thing. Someone sent me this reel, and it can't be true, but it's on the internet. Someone sent me this reel the other day, and it said that Mother's Day was the number two holiday celebrated in America now, right under Christmas. Mother's Day is. Father's Day ranked 22, <laughs> like 22. <laughs> Again, I don't know if this is real. You have to look it up on Wikipedia. But uh, 21 was Arbor Day. <laughs> like what? It's like, it's like trees and then dads. Like we're almost there, dads. But those crepe myrtles are pretty. All right, here we go. All right. I think I have a point. Here we go. Dad's in the room. You have every resource you need to be successful. Second Peter says this. It says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. I want to read that verse again because I think there's dads in this room that, man, you're struggling in here. And maybe you're struggling because your kids are struggling and you feel the weight of your own responsibility. Or maybe you're struggling because you have a, a situation right now that you don't know exactly how to handle it and navigate it. And I want you to know that the scripture says that his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So God says, I have what you need, but you have to seek me. You have to, to trust me. I'm so thankful for so many dads in this room that I have watched and learned from. But dads, we've got to use the tools at our disposal and the right tool for the right job makes it so much easier. So I, I want to give you a couple things today, some, so, some tools. I used this analogy of many years ago, but from dad's toolbox, I want to give you these just rapid fire. I want you to jot these down because God's given us some resources, dad, but we have to press into them with an earnest dependence on the grace of God. We have to, fathers, if we're gonna lead successfully, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. Write this down. Number one of dad's toolbox, this is A rather, is God's word. Fathers in the room, we've gotta love God's word. We've gotta be in God's word. James 1 says, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Dads, the scripture says we need to be listening I hope you're listening in the room. The scripture says we need to be listeners, beloved. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Verse 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Dads, the scripture says that, that, that wrath doesn't produce the righteousness of God in our life. We can't walk around angry all the time. We gotta deal with that. And we can't put that anger on our children. We can't put that anger on our wife. We put, can't put that anger on these other places of our life because it blows up in our face. And the enemy just sits back and laughs at us. We've got to be in the word of God. We can't be easily angered. Look at verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. And here it is. Watch this. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Is that word meekness, what is it? Humility. It's I want to receive. It's God, I don't have it figured out and I'm listening to you. It's God, I need your help. It's God, I can't do this on my own. I'm depending on you. I'm seeking you. This is meekness right here. Humility, submission to the word of God. Have you ever tried to help somebody and as you're helping them, they're, they're, they're talking over you of why they don't need your help? You try to go with me? Like you're trying to help someone and you're like, well, here's what I think of you. Oh, I know. Oh, no, but here's what I think. Oh, no, no, for sure. Well, here's what I, and they're, and they're just, they keep talking. Like, what do you do when someone's doing that? I don't know what you do. I know what your boy does. What do you, why do I keep saying your boy? Gosh, like I'm 12. Like, like 12 year olds don't even talk like that. But uh, hey, do you know, does that mean, what do you do when, when you're trying to tell someone something and they keep cutting you off like they already know the answer? What do you do? Anybody? Stop talking. <laughs> like, right? If you got it figured out, okay. Good luck, soldier. Like, like okay, that sounds great. You know what you're doing. And I wonder how many times God is trying to speak in us and we're like, okay, okay, sure, yeah, okay, okay, no, no, but I'm gonna, okay, okay, I'm gonna, and God says, you're gonna have to walk in those ways and there's an end there. When you get to that end, I'm still gonna be here because my mercy is more, my grace is more, and when you're ready 
to listen and have me speak truth into you, your heavenly father is, is ready. Some of us are in the messes we're in right now because we have not listened to God when he's told us what to do. And it's why we are where we are. And instead of blaming God, we need to take a look in the mirror and start seeking him. And the scripture says with meekness, we need to receive the word of God. But if we're angry, it's swift to talk. We don't want, we don't want to listen. We're, not, we're, not, we're going to miss the beautiful resource that God's word is. If meekness is anything for us fathers in this room, it's teachability. Fathers, do we have a teachable spirit? Do we have a teachable spirit? I get, I get nervous for, for even young men who aren't fathers, who, who begin to not have this teachable spirit or, or who don't walk in humility. It's just dangerous. The Bible says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know what that means? You don't want to be on the side God opposes. And he gives grace to the humble, right? It's like this. Fathers, imagine trying to build a house from scratch with, with no blueprint or four floor plans. Now, some of you are like tough guys in here. You're like, I could do it, Pastor. You don't know what I could do. I built so many homes. I think I could do it. All right. It's a bad analogy for seven of you, all right? But the rest of us, the rest of us, I think we'd be, we'd be, we'd be in trouble, right? And that's how it is when we try to raise our family and our children without the word of God. We're trying to do it on our own and figure it out and make it up as we go along. And you could do that probably for a little while, and it might look okay, but eventually the house is going to collapse. God's word is a gift from a good God that loves us and a heavenly father who wants to help us. And so men, find a way to get in his word. Find a way to get in his word. Download the U version app. Get your Bible out. Get, the, get a daily bread. Start somewhere. I'm going to be in God's word. I'm going to look in God's word. Don't go from not reading God's word to trying to do a, an hour and 30 minute Puritan Bible study plan. All right, You're going to be discouraged at 3 a.m. But I'm going to start somewhere and allow the engrafted word of God to begin to penetrate my heart. And I'm going to pray for God to give me a love for it. B, these are resources that we have at our disposal. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Charles Butler taught on the Holy Spirit in men's prayer this morning. I was so encouraged by that. Just the benefits of the Holy Spirit in our life. Ephesians 5 says this, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, it's better if I leave because I'm going to send a helper to you, the spirit to live within us. And Paul says in Ephesians that we are to be surrendered to the spirit. It's led by. So I'm, I'm emptying myself of, of, of my goals and my selfish desires. And God, I want your will for my life. I want to seek and be obedient to your ways. Why? Because we're not just a Christian family. We are a Christ-centered home. He's everything for us. He's our rock, our, our fortress. Listen, we, we need to make sure we are asking the Holy Spirit of the living God to help us, which leads us to see prayer. Resources at our disposal, fathers, that we can seek prayer. First Timothy says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. The I desire there means be minded to. It means we need to be asking for help. We've got to be praying James says he gives wisdom to those who ask. And the problem many times in our life, I think, is we don't ask because we really don't want to know the answer because we actually know the answer. You tracking with me? So, Grant, I ain't praying because I know in order for something to change, watch this, we got to change. In, in order for something to get better in this situation, I, I'm going to have to take it hardcore on the chin. And that's called humility. And it's, you know what? It was my fault. And you know what? I am sorry. And maybe I haven't done the things that I've always supposed to do, but I'm praying and God has convicted me that starting today, I want to do my best to do those things. And I'm praying you have the grace and mercy to forgive me, but God has put a calling on my life to lead and love. And that's what I want to do. And that's not going to happen apart from the Holy Spirit working in our life and us praying and asking for help. And maybe you're here and you're like, dude, you don't understand my situation. I, I have a, a hormonal teenager. I have a, I have a toddler. I, I got a difficult job. Grant, you don't know my story. Sounds good for you, preacher boy. I have a wife that's hard to please. 
All of those things are more and more examples of why you better pray. (laughs) Now, you better pray. You better ask God for help. You're trying to do it on your own. You're not going to do it on your own. I'm just telling you, I know where that road goes. You can't do it on your own. When you're believing a lie, if you think you can, you're trying to build a deck with a screwdriver and some floss. (laughs) And God's like, I I have a drill and a tape measure and some plans, but you're not asking for it. And we need to, gentlemen, in this room. D, some things that we need. We need a church family. These are resources that we have. Hebrews 10 says, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together as the manage of some, but manner of some rather, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. It's another big one for me that I just, I don't feel like can be overlooked. But the importance of church family, good examples that are around you, people that, that can encourage you. Dads, you weren't created to be on an island. You need the church and the church needs you. Not forsaken means don't take it for granted. Stay plugged in. It's why we do Life University classes in the fall. We want you to to make some different connections with men. It's why we focus on small groups so much. Because dads, listen, this is important. When you are growing, you take the whole family with you. When you're growing, dad in the room, you take the whole family with you. And when you're slipping, the family most of the time is going to slip with you. And so we want to raise godly champions for Christ. We need to be a godly champion for Christ to the best of our ability, right? And man, if you don't have kids in the room, I want to encourage you, start now. No, don't wait till you have that baby to say, now I'm going to begin to build this life of, of character and faithfulness and love for God and his things. You start doing it now so you can lead your family that way. I read this quote earlier this week. When a father attends church, there's a 93% chance that everyone else in the household will too. When the father attends church, when the father's faithful, when the family's faithful, excuse me, when the father's faithful, the family is faithful. And I want to encourage you, dads in the room, be faithful to God's house. Let your kids know where your source is. E, godly friends. These sort of go together with church family. But Proverbs 27 says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of a friend. I, I didn't just say you need friends in the room, but you need godly friends. You need people around you who are going to speak truth into you, encouraging you to lead. Do you have anybody in your life that has permission to call you out? Anybody in your life that has permission to tap you on the shoulder and go, bro, you're not thinking right on this. You handle that situation wrong. Now, that's hard to get there, right? Some of you are like, yes, I have a bunch of people. They all live in my house. Like, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about friends, all right? Wives are like, thank you, brother. I've been praying that you would. No, no, I'm not talking about wives. I don't know who that was again. I'm really all over the place today. We need to have godly friends. If you have a bunch of friends you're hanging out with that love to bash their wives and complain all the time, you need to find some new friends. 1 Corinthians says, bad company corrupts good character. And dads, we need men in our life to encourage us, to challenge us to be better. And maybe you're here and you're like, great, are you trying to tell me to ditch my longtime friends? I've been friends with them for, for 30 years. If they are discouraging you from following Christ and his ways, ditch them. And don't let those friends, don't let those friends be what stops you from loving and serving your wife and your kids better, the the way God called you to. We need good friends in our life. And again, these are tools around us. Last one, very quickly, a life of holiness. Dad, this is a resource I think that God has given us. It's counterintuitive to raise your family, to attempt to raise your family as Christ-centered and live an unholy life. And so I think a lot of dads struggle because we have this life on Sunday mornings for two hours, and then we have a totally different life the rest of the week. And your kids see that. Your family see that. And eventually that bites you. Because the scripture says, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So God's called us to live a life of holiness. Psalm 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. God's not going to bless our family if we're, if we're hooked on pornography, if we're in relationships we shouldn't be in, if we're struggling with these sins in our life that are pet sins we, we think we have under control. God's not going to bless that. First Peter says, but he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct because it's written, be holy for I am holy. Holy, not perfect. None of us are going to be perfect in this room, but it's a desire of of sanctification, of becoming more and more like Christ. It's what he's called us to. Holy means set apart. Dads in the room, we can't live our lives like everybody else and expect something different. We can't live our lives like everybody else. 
And think, well, in our family, this is going to be different because I go to church 13 times a year. Your family's not going to be different. We need to be wholly set apart, dependent on the Lord. These are resources that God gives to our disposal. God's word, the Holy Spirit, prayer, church, family, godly friends, a life of holiness. Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. So dads in the room, my encouragement to you in humility and, and meekness is we can build the house that God desires for us to build. And here's the best part. He's not calling you to do it on your own. I learned this a long time ago because I'm just not very handy. And, and when I was in my early 20s, I'd be discouraged by that. And there's things that I've learned. Again, I act like I don't know the difference between a Phillips head and a flathead. I have an idea, all right? I'm not a complete knucklehead up here. But I don't have the skill that a lot of people have had. But you know what I've learned over the years? is that I don't have to have that skill if I have friends that have that skill, right? Again, Orville, I talk about Orville. Like, there's, there's a lot of things that I help build around here that Orville did 99%, and I just asked for the camera, and I put the last screw in. Am I right? Orville, Orville knows. You see, you see a picture of Grant online putting the screw in, just know he probably just showed up, all right? But just, but, but it being, have a relationship with others who can help. Here's the great thing spiritually for your life and my life. God is not calling you to anything and telling you to go do it on your own. He wants to be right there with you and encourage you and lead you and guide you. There's a perfect heavenly father that loves you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friend, I want you to hear this this morning. Dad in this room, son in this room, daughter in this room, the God of the universe knows you, loves you, sees you. Sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you that you might have life. All these resources of our, are available to you, but they come from a surrender to God. They come from salvation and a relationship with the God of the universe. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture teaches we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, can you hear this this morning? If you heard nothing else, the God of the universe loves you, knows you, sees you, and offers you a gift of salvation this morning. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friend, I want you to hear this this morning. The scripture says we've all sinned, we've all fallen short. That wage of our sin, that, what that sin does is it separates us from God forever. God sees us in that situation and being a loving, good, heavenly father, he made a way for us to have a relationship with him. And that way is accepting Jesus' payment on the cross of Calvary for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, puts their faith in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I ask you this question, friend? Are you trying to do it on your own? Maybe you're a mom in the room. You trying to do it on your own? Single adult in the room, are you trying to do it on your own? Father in the room, are you trying to do it on your own? The God of the universe loves you, sees you today, and offers you salvation if you'll put your faith and your trust in him. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer this morning? Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. We're gonna do two things this morning and we're gonna close. But I wanna ask this question today. If you die today, do you know heaven would be your home? I, I believe in moments like this, in the quietness of moments like this, God will reveal himself to us. So maybe you're here today and you're like, Grant, I don't know for sure if I died today that I would go to heaven. I don't know for sure there's been that moment in my life where I've placed my faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. I want to encourage you right where you are to call upon the name of the Lord. Just right where you are, confess your sins and ask God to forgive you of your sins. I want to lead you in something that we call the sinner's prayer. And it is not words said by a pastor that saves. It is not just repeat after me and you are saved. It is faith in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary that saves. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. 
And no one comes to the Father but through him. And the quietness of your heart, if you're here today, and you say, Grant, I believe Jesus died for me, and I want to receive the gift of salvation, I want you to pray this prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need you. Just online, would you pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need you. I believe you died in my place, and I want to receive you right now as my Savior. Would you pray that prayer this morning in the balcony? Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord, and I surrender all of me to you right now. Would you pray that prayer? Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord, and I surrender all of me to you right now. Oh, dear friend, if you made that decision today to put your faith and trust in Jesus, may we rejoice with you today. Excited for you today. I want to encourage you to do two things. Share that decision with somebody today before you leave. Just let someone know, I prayed that prayer today. I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. If you're on campus, when you leave on these back walls, it says fresh start on these back walls. On the balcony in the main floor, I want you to grab one of those bags. If for the first time today, you said, I'm a sinner and I need you, and you prayed and asked God to forgive you of your sins, grab one of those bags as you leave today. If you're online, you can just text Jesus to 98085 and we'll send you that same bag of information. There's a Bible in there as a gift for you to encourage you today. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word, your blessings, and your goodness. Thank you for salvation freely given through Christ. Thank you that you've not called us to do these things on our own. In Jesus' name. Let's do this together. Would everyone stand this morning? I want to close this morning being Father's Day special today. If you are here today, if you're a father in the room today, I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask you, we did this for Mother's Day, and it's a special time. And so I'm going to ask right now all the fathers in the room, uh, to make their way in one moment down front. And if, you are, if your kids are with you, son, daughter, I want you to walk down front with your dad today. And I'm gonna pray, and then when I get done praying, we're actually gonna be dismissed from the front today. So if you're a dad in the room, even the balcony, I know it's a long walk, but it's a special time. There are men and women in this room that wish they could stand beside their daddies today, but the Lord has already taken them home. So I want all the fathers right now to make your way down front. All the dads, just step out right now. I know it's awkward, you gotta step through. If you're with your kids today, if your kids are here and you can stand with your daddy, find your daddy. We're not all going to fit because, again, none of us would be here without dads, all right? So I know we're not going to fit, but I would like everyone to come down. If you can get beside your daddy today and just stand beside him, put your arm on him. I just want to pray for all the dads in the room, thankful for these men, thankful for the calling that God has put in their life. So make your way down. We'll wait on you guys from the balcony. like seeing all these kids coming with their daddies. It's an encouragement. Fight through. If someone says, excuse me, they're trying to get to their daddy here just in a moment. But this is just a special time. And again, I know as a church family, so many of you that have lost your fathers in this past year, these last few years, and um, this is also a very hard day, but we rejoice. I'm thankful for all the dads in this room. And dads, I, I believe it starts with you. I believe God's placed a calling on your life, whether your kids are at home or your kids aren't at home that God still desires to use you. And so I'm praying that you will be strong in the Lord in the power of his might and do what God has called you to. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for all the dads that are here today. Lord, I pray that you would just bless each father, each grandfather. Lord, I pray for those that are brokenhearted today. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen and uphold these men with your mighty right hand. Father, give them wisdom and courage to, to lead their families in a way that honors you. I pray that you would surround each dad with a brother in Christ that, that could encourage them and that they could be an encouragement too, Lord. We're not called to do this on our own. God, again, be with those today that are just struggling on this Father's Day. Lord, I pray you would meet every need as a good heavenly Father because you are good. Lord, I pray for the fathers that have come down front this morning God, help them to know that you are a God that rewards faithfulness. Father, help them to know that true success does not lie in, in accomplishments or promotions, but true success lies in you. So God, help them to steward their children well, knowing, Father, that, that ultimately they belong to you. God, bless them. 
strengthen them, give them wisdom and guidance, Lord, whether their children are young in the home or whether their children are gone for years. God, give them wisdom, Lord, to bless and love their children well. Lord, help us to be fathers that glorify you. Help us, Father, we pray. Strengthen us. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings on this Father's Day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.